Good afternoon, colleagues. I would like to start the afternoon meeting, so I ask for silence, please. First point on our agenda for the afternoon is the presentation of the draft report on the electronic mass surveillance of EU citizens, rapporteur being Mr. Moraes. I will give the floor uh, first to the rapporteur. Please, Mr. Moraes. Thank you very much, Chair. Sorry, I'm just having a sip of water. Um, thank you very much, um, Kinga, and thank you, uh, colleagues, for your attendance. I realise this is a Thursday afternoon and um, we're making a presentation of the main report today, but thank you for your attendance. And I know this is web streamed and um, I know other colleagues will read the report in due course. Um, I want to, first of all, begin with a thank you to um, all the various um, colleagues who have um, put together their working documents, um, uh, which has enabled me to present today the main report of the Committee of Inquiry uh, into mass surveillance. This has been a very uh, difficult and challenging task, Chair, um, which has um, lasted over, or is going to last over a period of approximately six months. Um, a very challenging task. Um, mainly into allegations emanating from the, um, the allegations of Mr. Snowden, but also um, in the context, a very important context uh, here within the European Union, um, of our own developments, uh, most notably our own developments on the data protection regulation and the context in which we ourselves in the European Union we're making advances um, on very important um, key elements of our own uh, advances on, on privacy. So um, it was very important for us in this last six months uh, to put together an inquiry, and I'm very happy that the, um, our Secretariat has worked very hard um, in a very short space of time uh, to put to go together a range of witnesses, which has enabled us now to assemble a, a report together with these key working documents um, uh, and, and enabled me to put together a draft which I'm going to present to you today. Um, the working draft on uh, mass surveillance um, really results in uh, three elements. First of all, um, 18 um, main findings and then a set of recommendations and a priority plan. It's very important, first of all, in relating to the main findings, that we had a set of um, witnesses in our inquiry. And <coughs> in the inquiry, where we saw a whole set of witnesses, ranging from journalists uh, to whistleblowers uh, to parliamentary scrutiny committees um, uh, to um, technical experts, that we were not a court of law or a forensic body, but we were assembling, in a sense, um, evidence, uh, primary evidence, secondary evidence, but essentially circumstantial evidence, where we were trying to build a picture. As any national parliamentary inquiry would do, we as a European parliamentary inquiry were trying to build a picture around a set of allegations uh, made by Edward Snowden and trying to make sense of what was going on. We were also tasked in this um, inquiry uh, with um, bringing forward a set of recommendations about the future, about what we would say about the way intelligence services were operating, uh, the way that data was being collected on citizens, uh, and how mass surveillance was being operated within the European Union. We were looking at our relationship in relation to data between the Uni European Union and the United States, and we were also looking at the future. How would privacy operate in relation to the European Union and our relationship with the United States for the future? So the findings uh, were built, um, and the 18 findings in this report, were built on the evidence we took 
uh, from the inquiry and on the various sources that we built uh, during the process of the inquiry. The recommendations and the priority plan were then built on those findings. And in looking at the recommendations, um, we built not just on the inquiry itself, but on the substantial expertise of members across this House who, I have to emphasise, worked on the issue of data and privacy for many, many months, indeed years, before this inquiry even began. So on the issues of passenger name records, on the issue of SWIFT, on the issue of Safe Harbour, all of these key names that people are so familiar with, these were issues, of course, which parliamentarians here <coughs> present were working on well before this inquiry. This is a mature parliament when it comes to the issue of data protection and privacy. And this is very important because this takes this um, parliament over and above, in my view, um, the way that national parliaments were looking at this issue. We, in a sense, should be looking at this issue in, in the way that we have competence on many areas of data privacy because we were already working in these areas. And of course, the central area that we were working on um, in relation to Mr. Albrecht's report, the Data Protection Regulation and of course the Data Protection Directive, meant that the timing was extremely important. We were working on the major piece of international legislation in this area while these allegations were being made. So I expect that colleagues will, in time if they have not already, looked at this draft report, looked at the 18 main findings and recommendations. I should also mention that my colleagues in the Foreign Affairs Committee looked at this whole area of the EU and US and the building of and rebuilding of trust between the, the European Union and the United States. But when my colleagues um, here present and those who are not here look at the <coughs> recommendations um, and the priority plan which I'm now going to go into in more detail, um, they should do so uh, not um, as a national parliament would do, but in a sense that we as a European Parliament are looking to the future. It's up to us in this European Parliament to have some settlement on the issue of privacy. Um, and I think the first thing I will do, therefore, is to concentrate my next comments on the recommendations, because there I think the report is most relevant, and it takes a lot from the working documents of my colleagues. Um, and I want to immediately go to those recommendations and refer as well to those working documents. And let me first of all point to the recommendations, um, which I think will elicit most from uh, the way that the narrative of this uh, report has been written. The recommendations are pointing to where we want to take um, the future of um, our privacy. In a sense, we want to build um, a kind of uh, European um, habeas corpus, if I just, if, excuse me one second, I'm just going to um, refer to our recommendations. The first recommendation um, is on the question of safe harbour. The report reiterates the message um, from the working document of Mr Axel Voss, which called on the Commission to suspend the safe harbour principles which allows US companies to transfer da the data of U EU citizens to the US while providing an adequate level of protection. On the TFTP, in accordance with the Parliament resolution, the draft report calls for suspension of the current TFTP agreement until the conditions as laid out in our resolution have been met. For example, while Commissioner Malmstrom concluded that there had been no breach of the TFTP after a consultation procedure with the US, this conclusion is not, is not only based on assurances by the US, and we would ask that a thorough investigation is continued with our US partners in, name, in the name of rebuilding trust in the agreement. And here I also want to mention that uh, my colleagues um, Sophie Intervelt and uh, Cornelia Erst have done a lot of work in their working documents um, on our relationship with the United States and on the, re and on the issue of oversight mechanisms. It is absolutely important that in the report 
we've looked at the value of oversight mechanisms, the way that we um, look at how uh, we regard um, the way that the allegations have shed light on our relationships and how we have to rebuild trust in this area. On EU data protection reform, the report specifically calls on the Council to begin work on the data protection package so that an agreement is reached by 2014 at the latest. In addition, it reiterates the importance of both the regulation and the directive being adopted as a package. The Parliament have already sent a strong message on this under the rapporteurship of Jan Albrecht, so it is for the Council to now start working on it immediately. The EU-US Data Protection Framework Agreement, the Umbrella Agreement, this is vital and we welcome the Commission's aim of adopting this agreement by spring 2014. The main importance of this is to provide judicial redress for EU citizens. We've made this very clear during the inquiry to our US counterparts. And the key point is that in the issue of mass surveillance, we are here for the protection of our EU citizens. And that is the message that we want to send cl clearly. At the moment, EU citizens simply do not enjoy full and reciprocal judicial redress rights as, uh, as uh, in the US courts as guaranteed only to US persons. On top of this, completing the negotiations would restore trust in transatlantic data transfers. On TTIP, of course, the draft report recognises the major importance of TTIP for economic and job growth for both the EU and US. However, we've strongly underlined that in building this trust, we have to ensure that strong data privacy protections are achieved separately from the TTIP for obvious reasons. On EU cloud computing, the report also recognises the importance of a swift development of an EU cloud as it ensures protections for EU citizens' data, given that any data they store in the cloud of US companies can potentially be accessed by the NSA. An EU cloud could ensure that businesses apply the high standards of EU data protection rules. In addition, one positive aspect of these disclosures is the potential economic advantage that it may protect that it may bring EU businesses. On journalists and whistleblowing, uh, throughout the inquiry, the Libya Committee had heard several statements by journalists, whistleblowers and civil society on the need for strong protection of freedom of information uh, and from civil society on the need for strong protection um, in, the in the sensitive area of intelligence activities. Furthermore, um, from key journalists, including people like Alan Rusbridger of The Guardian, we saw reactions uh, to disclosures from Edward Snowden that have had, that were quoted as having a chilling effect. Reports called, uh, the report calls for the Commission to issue a comprehensive report on whistleblowers um, to include the field of security. On IT security, the Snowden disclosures we believe, or I believe, have exposed a huge weakness in the IT security of EU institutions. <coughs> this was further highlighted by the reports last month by, the Fre by a French newspaper when a hacker was able, sorry, sorry, some weeks ago, when a hacker was able to access MEP and staff email without much effort. It is clear that there is a security problem in the EU institutions. As I mentioned earlier, we need to rebuild um, trust between the EU and US. And here we have a number of paragraphs within the report from our colleagues within the Foreign Affairs Committee and from colleagues within the Libe, Libe Committee. And we've had a number of interactions with our um, uh, colleagues in Congress. Here it is clear that <coughs> it is not just a question of diplomacy, but um, of understanding that we must have interactions which lead to concrete actions. And the recent review uh, by the White House uh, and our um, continual monitoring of court actions and federal court actions in the United States and our continual interest um, in developments there are very important for the EU. The, I want to finally um, talk about the um, excuse me, just one second. In conclusion, finally, colleagues, I want to just say that the 
the narrative of this report is that we want to look to the future and we want to ensure that, um, in conclusion, that this is a report which doesn't just evaporate as soon as this um, mandate is over. And Chair, if I could just say this in conclusion. We want to ensure that this report lasts into the next mandate and is a, a blueprint for institutions for the next mandate. In that sense, I'm calling in this report uh, for the EU institutions and member states to support and promote a sort of European digital habeas corpus, um, to commit ourselves to act as an EU citizens' rights watchdog with a timetable to monitor implementation. I've set out on page 33 a proposed timetable uh, where we can monitor the kinds of recommendations <coughs> that we've made in the report so that this report is not some static uh, report which is just then put on a shelf but that we have a way of following it up. And in that sense, I want it to be a dynamic document that reaches into the next mandate that ensures that it's not just the type of report that would happen in a national legislature but, but uh, dips into the uh, rich uh, privacy uh, knowledge that we've had in this parliament and is a dynamic document. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Morais. Now I would uh, give the floor to all the shadow rapporteurs, but I have to ask for your permission because I, I have a colleague from Offet, Mr. <laughs> Saraflanka, who has to leave, uh, as I've heard. So if you, if you agree, I will give the floor to our uh, colleague from Offet on this issue and then start the, uh, the round of the shadow rapporteurs. Do you agree with that? Okay, then, Mr. Fra Salafranca. Gracias, señora Presidenta. Gracias a los ponentes en la sombra. Efectivamente, tengo que... Thank you, Madam. Uh, I thank you to the shadow rapporteurs. I do indeed have to catch a plane at three. I just wanted to thank the rapporteur, Mr. Moraes, for the excellent cooperation that we've had in his draft report there are 16 paragraphs that bear more directly on matters of foreign policy and he has stuck pretty closely to the terms of the working document that with the other two coordinators in the Foreign Affairs Committee we tabled. However, there are some things which could be improved. With there are 50 recitals and 116 paragraphs in this report. It's a full and ambitious report, as is required by the amplitude of the subject. Uh, so there are some things which can be improved, I think. And one important thing to improve would be to strengthen uh, the um, cooperation in the anti-terrorist fight uh, in the United States for the benefit of both regions. And there are other things, very few other things. I'll go through them quickly. Firstly, paragraph 6, which I think could be better drafted in terms of its practical consequences. Paragraph 9. In stronger possible terms, evidentemente todos hemos... Obviously... We've all said that these are activities that certainly should be rejected, but I'd remind the committee that the resolution of the European Parliament usually uh, keep these things uh, more for these terms for crimes against humanity. So perhaps we could respect the spirit but find a form of words that was more consistent with the, with the kind of uh, um, criticism that we want to express. Then paragraph 53 is, of course, very sensitive. I was one of those who, together with other uh, colleagues, was responsible for transmitting it to the House of Representatives and the Senate of the United States, that uh, in this present context, I said, we said the European Parliament wouldn't be able to ratify the trade and investment agreement. So this is, I think, a sensitive point. Once again, I believe we can find a form of words that respects its sensitivity, but nonetheless uh, expresses that in more reasonable terms. At all events, in conclusion, Madam Chairman, let me once again thank the rapporteur for his understanding, his open-mindedness and his sensitivity, and I hope that this excellent cooperation that there has been so far with the Foreign Affairs Committee will continue over the last stages of this report, that is to say when amendments come to be tabled and when the vote comes. Lafranco, and then... Uh we turn to the round of shadow rapporteurs. Mr. Foss, please.
Vielen Dank, Frau Vorsitzende. Zunächst möchte ich mich auch bei dem Bericht Thank you, Madam. I too would like to thank the rapporteur. I think uh, that this uh, report is a very good basis. It says, it's saying that we should continue to observe this. Uh, and that's an important point that Parliament needs to be making. It covers many things and uh, affects many aspects that have come into play in this context. And that's why I think that the this is a very good basis for the assessment of the whole issue of mass surveillance. If we look at what we wish to achieve, we need to uh, reinstate a trust in communications of the future, also trust in the transatlantic friendship, the loss of control uh, over our own data is something that we need to bring back into balance and uh, communications in Europe need to be made uh, more secure. We need to protect privacy of individuals but also the technological infrastructure uh, in Europe needs to be secured against uh, espionage and uh, the European institutions also need to be better protected uh, uh, against uh, this kind of attack. So on international agreements, the so-called anti-spy agreement, I mean, we could uh, discuss whether that serves the purpose, but I do think that this uh, umbrella uh, agreement is something we need, and that's uh, outlined, uh, even called for in the report, and. Uh, I am in agreement with that. With that. The safe harbor mechanism, I think, uh, is uh, something that uh, affects uh, people greatly. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to uh, reach an agreement on that and hopefully also on the technical developments and adaptation of them, saying that we don't want uh, any uh, economic uh, espionage, that's quite uh, right, and that also we need to organize uh, this, these activities in the future. Of course, it's necessary in that case that we strengthen uh, our defense at member state level and at institutional level, and perhaps we would like to create a basis uh, for uh, a, a common uh, cooperation, form of cooperation with uh, partners in uh, third countries. I think what is of, of particular importance, because we haven't seen any signs from the Atlantic side on this, I think we need better technological independence for Europe, and we need to work towards that. The cloud was mentioned. Perhaps uh, also uh, routing should be uh, restructured, cryptological elements should perhaps uh, be made better use of. Perhaps we should also uh, be thinking about the cyber centre being strengthened in, in Europol and in Nice, in Anisa for Perhaps ENISA perhaps needs to be made better use of and uh, brought up to speed if we're going to give it the task of uh, securing the European institutions. I want to come to an end now, but I think that there are also uh, elements in public procurement where we can uh, make improvements on hardware and software in general in Europe and, uh, and, and look at uh, the granting of contracts in sensitive areas and how we can improve that. Well, those are my points. I have to leave shortly, so I won't be able to hear the uh, answers, unfortunately, but my congratulations on this report.
Thank you, Chair, and thanks to the, the Rapporteur um, and to my, my colleagues, the Shadows, for um, the document that's before us. I think it is, uh, it's an, an, an excellent, a very comprehensive uh, package, and I have, I'd, I'd like to start by saying that I'm, um, I'm actually very pleased and proud to be a member of this European Parliament, because we seem to be the only institution that's really doing this, this kind of job. Um, in Europe. Um, first of all, uh, regarding the procedure, um, I agree with the rapporteur that these recommendations should be, let's say, adopted as a kind of package that we then leave as a, as a, a legacy to the next uh, European Parliament for implementation. Um, with regard to data protection, you rightfully say that that's been on the agenda for, for many, many years. It's, it's nothing new. Um, but it's all the more urgent now that the package is adopted and that a package is adopted that meets the standards that have been set out by the European Parliament. And in this respect, I find it worrying and, uh, uh, and actually quite shocking that the member states, despite all the revelations, are still seeking to water down the data protection package. Um, I won't say very much about the recommendations on uh, oversight over the activities of um, uh, intelligence services because we've been discussing that when we were presenting our working document. Um, then uh, I think it's also, it's also very important to look at the issue of enforcement because it's not all about new legislation. For example, we have good data protection legislation in place. It may be a bit, you know, it may be in need of, of, of uh, updating, but it's there. Um, and I'm pretty sure that all these mass surveillance activities are a violation of the existing laws. So we would expect the governments, the national governments and or the national authorities and the European Commission to be a bit or, or a lot more strict in enforcing the rules, because if we adopt new legislation and again it's not enforced, then what's the point? If we accept that our own rules, our own laws are being overruled by laws from a third country, any third country, then why bother passing legislation in the first place? Then we've got better things to do. Um, uh, and this, for example, in this respect, I would also like to, uh, to refer to the uh, the non-investigation uh, by the member states and by Europol into the alleged break into the SWIFT service uh, in the Netherlands. And I'm very glad that the Working Party 29 decided to, uh, uh, or it's actually, I believe, the Dutch and the Belgian authorities who are conducting a joint um, inquiry. Um, and I think we should follow very closely what they are doing and try and include their conclusions in our report if that's possible. Um, I'd also like to remind colleagues that this House, in adopting uh, a report of mine two years ago, has called for an in-depth evaluation of counter-terrorism policies, and I believe that becomes uh, topical and relevant again against the backdrop of everything we know now. Um, I think it may be in here somewhere, Mr. Rapporteur, but then I've overlooked it, but I think we should definitely recommend that at the next revision of the EU treaties, power should be created for the European Parliament to conduct a full, a full parliamentary inquiry. We should have the power to summon witnesses and to hear them under oath. We should have more powers to conduct a full parliamentary inquiry. Uh, I also think um, we should look at the um, at transparency and access to documents as the, the kind of, you know, part of checks and balances which are vital to uh, a healthy democracy. Um, and it's very, very worrying that the, the talks on the revision of the uh, transparency regulation are still blocked. Um, Investing in, uh, in IT security, I think, is, is going to be a very important part of all the, uh, the recommendations because if one thing has become clear to, to me, at least, uh, in the past months, it's that we should, that we've been very naive, that the first thing we should do is um, invest in the security of our, our systems to begin with the systems of this house. 
And, you know, we've asked questions. And there's still, I don't, there's still, sir? The replies are expected next week. Oh, well, if there are any hackers out there, you've got until next week, you know. <laughs> you better hurry up. I mean, there's still printed notices up on the walls in this building saying the Wi-Fi is down. This is a joke. This is a joke. You know, maybe we should, instead of putting up notices saying the Wi-Fi is down, we should have sent out invitations to people, not only hackers, but, but cyber criminals and, and, and what have you, saying, you know, the doors are open. <laughs> um, so, um, yes, no, but seriously, and I also think that, the, you know, there are people here, civil servants, highly paid civil servants, who are responsible for the security of this system. And I don't think it's good enough that we get a reply two months after the, the alleged break-in. I mean, if this were a company, the persons would be out on the street by now. They would have been sacked. Why is it that we tolerate that we don't get a reply to this and our system is still not secure? Can anybody explain that to me? Because I fail to understand, but that's probably my fault. Um, two final remarks, uh, one on, on uh, EU cloud computing. I'm very much in favor of uh, encouraging our own European capacity. I'm not in favor of putting a fence around a European internet or something like that. This is not about protectionism, this is about boosting our own uh, industries and our own capacities and make sure that citizens, first of all, have a choice and secondly, that companies have an incentive for, uh, for, building, uh, for, for building stronger and better protected systems. I, I think the, the remark of, I cannot remember the name of the German gentleman we had here, the German, uh, let's say, uh, hacker who said, if you buy a car and uh, the brakes are faulty, then, you know, the manufacturer of the car is liable. Why do we accept systems which, are, which aren't secure? I think that was one of the most relevant remarks that we've heard. And finally, on TTIP, um, I am very much in favor of transatlantic free trade, or any free trade indeed. Um, but, of course, we cannot decide to a free trade agreement until the whole situation has been clarified and we have watertight guarantees um, for... The, the, the rights and freedoms of our citizens. So I'm, I'm looking forward to further debates and uh, I hope that we're going to uh, adopt a really strong package of recommendations in March. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Entwert. Mr. Albrecht. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, also uh, one thank you to the rapporteur uh, who has presented a very good starting point uh, for conclusions for our um, inquiry here in the European Parliament. It's now six months ago that uh, the revelations of Edward Snowden uh, showed us the ongoing meltdown of rule of law and the fundamental right to privacy and data protection, which is actually human right in Europe. And uh, I think it's very important to say that uh, it's not uh, this meltdown is not taking place because of Edward Snowden and it's not taking place only since then. It's taking place because of the activities and the uh, measures and legislations in place by our own governments. Uh, and uh, Mr. Snowden has revealed it with great courage and I think that we first of all should say this clearly in our report and we should also call clearly for him to be acknowledged as what he is, a whistleblower, blowing the whistle on ongoing infringements, heavy infringements to the fundamental rights of all European citizens. And I think that should be worth uh, a secure stay in a European member state so that we can also hear him directly and his information. Secondly, I think that the points uh, which have been made by the rapporteur and also by the shadows on the importance of European data protection legislation and the framework agreement uh, between the European Union and the United States to better protect the privacy and data protection rights of European citizens is central as a conclusion to uh, this inquiry. Uh, it's important that our citizens get the control about their personal data. That's the best protection we can give them. But also, of course, we need control and oversight. Uh, and that means, I think, not only uh, some blurry oversight, but clear parliamentary oversight, not only on the side of the USA, also here in the European Union. 
In, in our inquiry, we saw clearly that there is ongoing activity of our own European intelligence services, uh, either on cooperation with the NSA or on their own, which is uh, doing massive surveillance on our own citizens. And it should be clear that there is effective control in place. No control, by the way, is in place on the level of the European Union, because there is still the exclusion of national security completely. But we have heard also representatives of national parliaments, and I ha haven't had the impression that there is effective control in place on the national level. So we should fix that, and there should be rules on the cooperation and the work of intelligence services in Europe, European Union rules, so I think we should also uh, draw that conclusion. By the way, there's also obviously no enforcement by uh, police authorities or other authorities, competent authorities, uh, cyber security or data protection authorities when it comes to the cyber attacks launched by third state authorities or third state companies or companies based here in Europe on uh, the uh, servers and systems of uh, telecommunications uh, providers. I don't see why this is happening. Europol has uh, uh, again and again uh, claimed that obviously there's no request by any national authority on the investigation even of these cyber attacks. I think this is ridiculous. That's a scandal. The, we have a lack of law enforcement, a huge lack of law enforcement, and uh, we just passed our own cybercrime rules recently. We should be keen on enforcing it, and that should be part of our conclusions. And then let me say that this, uh, of course, links also to the systems and to the security of systems. And Sophie and Feld just mentioned that this is a central part of uh, um, of liability, for example, for uh, systems which provide the adequate safeguards we need in a digitalized society, I think that rather than breaking or subsidizing the, the breach of uh, encryption and uh, subsidizing, subsidizing surveillance measures more and more, we should invest in encryption powers in anonymization systems because we need to strengthen citizens and consumers to protect themselves if they want to communicate in private. Private communication, by the way, is also a human right. We should insist on that to be enforced, not only here in Europe, but also globally, that's clear. But we should walk ahead as a positive example. And I read with very uh, uh, much um, uh, uh, yeah, happiness that there's uh, a clear uh, reference to the a necessity to end up with blanket retention, retention of personal data without uh, suspicion. But then please, let's spell out in detail that this means we need to talk about the data retention directive in the European Union, and we need to talk about those politicians still seeing that, uh, still saying that the retention, the vast retention of passenger name records will solve our security problems. That's not the case. That's not the case, and anyway, it's not proportionate, it's blanket retention and breach of our fundamental rights. Last but not least, uh, let me say that uh, I think we really need to uh, draw a line of what is acceptable um, to, uh, to draw for uh, either control or oversight um, of of us all in societies when it comes to data, when it comes to communication, and we need to draw out clear lines what is not, not acceptable, and we also need to work on effective oversight mechanisms. And we need to do that as a European Parliament, no matter what our governments say, because obviously since six months they are not in uh, the position and not capable to deal with these revelations properly, to, to draw the conclusions which we need. The European citizens are looking at this House, and there's elections coming up in May, and we want them to see that this House makes a difference. So please, let's go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Albrecht. Mrs. Ernst. Yeah, vielen Dank. Uh yes, thank you very much, Madam Chairman. First of all, a warm word of thanks to the rapporteur because I think that um, this is one of those subjects where it's very difficult to draw all of those strands together. He's worked very intensively with us and on our behalf, and I'm sure he will continue to keep up the good work in the forthcoming weeks and months. 
Looking at this in the round, clearly this is one of the most important reports and no doubt one of the most difficult in, the, in this parliament. Um, and that for a number of reasons. It's not just a, a breakdown of trust and confidence, although it is that. I think it's because we've, been, we've lost the big picture, confidence, trust between the US today and the European Union. And beyond that, it goes into deep-seated uh, social um, conundrums. For example, whistleblowing, whistleblowers. It, clearly, this is something which, goes, which uh, runs very deep indeed, because it, it goes right up to people's individual freedoms and also press freedoms, freedom of communication. And we do need a report which uh, can cover all of those things. We've only been able to get a glimpse over the past few months uh, because there's a whole world, the worlds of um, the, the member states, what is going on there as well, uh, because they have not been falling over themselves to investigate themselves. When it was found that um, Chancellor Merkel had been invited to a chat with um, President Obama, that's all very well. But looking around the countries, I must say that that stands out. And I think we've got to um, lift the veil in all of the member states as well. Now, moving on, there are some areas, of course, where we do not have much traction. For example, the legalities of the uh, situation with regard to non-Americans. Uh, um, if they are bereft of legal protections in this uh, context, then that, of course, is very serious. Therefore, it's important that we come up with an answer to the question of what we do about national security. Um, from an EU perspective, of course, internal security, external security, um, to what extent can we factor this into our equation? That's another major question mark. National security, um, however you approach that, has become a way of... Uh, it, it has the effect of putting things uh, out of bounds. It kind of, uh, as it were, disqualifies certain areas. And we cannot simply accept a blanket statement, this is a national security issue, therefore you have nothing to... Uh, it, this is of no concern to, to you at the EU level. Um, major questions about data protection and about the, the freedoms which have been affected here. Uh, therefore, um, we in the uh, GUI group welcome the uh, recommendations, welcome the report. I think that much came to light in the course of the um, meetings that we've had and this is not, it's not simply been lumped together. I think that um, the rapporteur has been trying very hard to draw out the, the essence of that, the gist of that. It's essential that we, don't, we can't simply carry on with safe harbour. We've got to start again. Now I'm not sure what, how else we could uh, take this. Surely if we do have existing agreements they must not be undermined. Um, and they must not be more honoured in the breach than in the observance. And the same applies to SWIFT. We have to make sure that it continues to be suspended. And that has to be our firm, our settled position in the, in the European Parliament. Um, there has been a big deficit on the law enforcement side. The Commission has not answered those questions at all. Um, TTIP, the biggest free trade agreement worldwide. How could we possibly push ahead with that? and um, minimise this or uh, say, well, we'll have a look at that, we'll tack on something at, at the end. I don't think that's how to do this. This is, this is not some um, adjunct. We are keeping up the, the pressure. We must continue to do that. Um, and I think that putting the TTIP on ice is the best way to, keep, to build up a head of steam, as it were, and make sure that we can press these um, rights uh, dimensions, EU-US framework um, agreement and umbrella on data protection is um, something else we must pay attention to. And protection of whistleblowers is very important in the report. That needs to be underpinned in terms of the legalities of that. Um, so it's got to be
quite uh, punchy, and in fact it should be written into the statute books of the member states as well. Um, we should be technologically independent. And, well, that's, I think that's um, a subject for debate. However, the question is, what is our angle on this? What are our priorities going to be? And I think we've got to focus on, on the right dimension of this within Libe. And we need to give thought to that before we continue with the next steps. Now, I think that, in general terms, we've now got to the point in the political debate where we've got to ask ourselves the question, uh, what is the intelligence community doing? What are the secret services there for? Um, is there, are their activities proportionate? What's the purpose of, um, as it were, covert uh, operations? These things need to come out into the open. And uh, secret agreements involving the um, secret services are very important as well, so that we know what's going on there as well. Surveillance and oversight of the security services how can that be organised? It's not enough for us to have a, a friendly chat with officials. We need something tangible, something hard and fast, which will um, hardwire the uh, oversight into our arrangements. Uh, so I can still see um, a large number of uh, gaps in the provision, anti-terror uh, as well. Let me just say that there comes a point when the Parliament has got to really um, be very robust here and make sure that we can answer these questions. There are a couple of questions which are still open-ended. Um, first of all, is all that we're doing, is it sufficient? Are we really getting to the heart of matters, the heart of the matter? Are we really, do we now have a handle on all the issues which arise in the context of mass surveillance? Can we address the problems which are being brought to light? And then secondly, what is going to be the fate of this report? Do we do this report simply for the Commission's benefit? Have a look at this, some food for thought. I think that we've got to talk about the powers of the Parliament. Uh, we're not going cap in hand here. This is not something which we're doing for the good of our um, health. It seems to me that we have got to beef up the, the powers which we have there so that we can uh, make a difference and then we will depend on assistance from the Member States. ...with the shadow rapporteurs and I have to be much more stricter with all the other members, I'm sorry. So I open the floor now for uh, the colleagues uh, who wish to intervene. I have six names, Mr. Pirker, Mrs. Latford, Mrs. Gomez, Mrs. Sargentini, Mrs. Jimenez Becerril and Mr. Andrew. Anybody else? No? Then I close this list and I give the floor to Mr. Pirker, please. Thank you, Frau Vorsitzende. Thank you, Madam Chairman. First of all, a, um, a few general um, observations and then something a bit more uh, detailed and practical at the end. First of all, thanks very much to Claude Amores for the very detailed and comprehensive full uh, report. It's turned out to be a very interesting uh, mix. On the one side, there's a, a practical description of uh, facts and figures, and the, um, which is a very useful basis. Uh, but on top of that, a, it's, we have the um, distilled wisdom of what we have heard in our dealings with the congressmen, with the senator, U, U.S. senators, so that we're able to um, make the case that it's not just uh, failing to uh, uphold the, the, the rules. Often they have been clearly breached, if not more than that. Are there any... I think if you looked at um, paragraph 21, it talks about calling on the member states not to allow... Um, surveillance on their territory, on, which has been perpetrated by third countries. Now, let's not be unrealistic here. And I think that there we might be accused of being a bit starry-eyed, a bit naive, um, if we really thought that this could be uh, delivered on and was going to be um, successful. Now, there are some um, recommendations here which may not be um, possible. Exchange of information, we would want that to be possible when this was to the mutual, uh, in, the, in the best interest of both sides. For example, the SWIFT um, uh, banking information 
data that may well be uh, necessary and uh, a, a good thing. It may bring benefits to both sides. Uh, so let's be a little bit careful and uh, nuance uh, statements such as that. Restoring trust, clearly that's in the best interests of uh, functioning economic cooperation and functioning uh, security cooperation between the EU and uh, the United States. A second objective we must set ourselves, ourselves is that we have to have um, the ability to defend our interests and protect our legitimate interests for in the industrial um, area, for example. We want EU citizens to have the same um, protections on US soil as um, US citizens have. Secondly, the framework agreement, very important. And thirdly, and very importantly, we've got to come out in no uncertain terms, more so than in the, um, in the report, and say we need to have counter-intelligence. I'm not saying that it's got to be a secret service of the kind that's sometimes suggested by the, uh, the Commission, but we've got to have the ability to stand up to um, surveillance activities on the part of third countries. We have got to be able to defend ourselves. Of course, that's got to be um, surrounded by the necessary safeguards and protections. Um, if you remember, we had a big debate surrounding Europol, cooperation between the security services, a multilateral agreement. I don't think we need a change to the treaties. Um, something can be organised on a multilateral basis quite quickly, I think. Uh, we have to make sure that there is proper uh, security where data is being exchanged in a way which is verifiable. Uh, Claude Murray's in 6566 has adumbrated some of the what this could be, but I think we've got to add detail. And this, I think, will increase the uh, pressure on member states to um, see to their own security services as well. Um, certainly technological independence and autonomy. Um, I think that we've got a lot of ground to, uh, to make up there. Um, and we talk about uh, the cloud and so on and so forth, uh, but we've got to make sure that all the safeguards are uh, in that virtual area as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm afraid I'm uh, going to be rude and make my comments and then I have to run. I apologise to colleagues for that. Um, I pick up on something that Sophie said about not being in favour of putting a fence around the internet in Europe, uh, which I utterly agree with. Therefore, I'm a bit worried with the use of the term independence in, in Europe. Um, I, I'm, I'm all in favour of putting extra resources into the development of European cloud services um, and IT services generally, but I wouldn't want any kind of balkanisation. And so I'm a little bit wary of, of that word and that term, in independence, um, which, uh, I mean, echoes v Vice President Reading uh, has used that term, and I personally don't find it terribly helpful. Um, then um, I do find a little bit of a contradiction I, in the report. I very much agree that um, the consent, Parliament's consent for TTIP uh, will depend on a lot of things, but one of them will be uh, the, the trust in, in the, um, in the uh, online environment, uh, uh, transatlantic online environment, although, of course, we always have to remember that it's not just the US which wants um, TTIP, it's, it's Europe as well. Um, but uh, I do find it a little surprising to call now for the suspension of safe harbour when in recitals Y and Z uh, there appears to be a relatively uh, favourable uh, reference to the fact that the uh, Commission has addressed 13 recommendations to the US and engaged to identify with them by summer 2014 the remedies to be implemented. Um, as soon as possible and providing the basis for a full review in, on safe harbour. And then there's reference in Z to how the F FTC has admitted that safe harbour uh, could be reviewed in order to improve it. So now obviously, you know, it depends when you're going to actually get any, any, any um, assurances and real safeguards and guarantees. But I just find it a little bit contradictory to note, apparently with approval, that there's a process going on to try and strengthen safe harbour 
And yet, call for suspension now. Nah. Um, and I, um, I admit that as Vice Chair of the US Delegation, I, I'm very keen on, on making a common economic space, not naively, not ignoring all the challenges and, and, and not least in the, on the online, uh, online environment, but I just a bit uncomfortable with the apparent contradiction there. Suspend safe harbour now, but of course there's an ongoing process to review it and hopefully strengthen and improve it. And I'm a bit uncomfortable with that. Thank you, Mrs. Latford. Mr. Moraes, you wanted to answer something before uh, Sarah Latford leaves. Yes. Kinka, thank you very much. I'm sorry to take up time. Just that before Mrs. Latford leaves and also to Sophie Interfelt, the point on cloud computing, um, both in my remarks and indeed in the uh, text of the report, I don't think it's very clear the way that I express the cloud computing point. I think it needs to be clarified, the fencing in and the way that it's been expressed on independence. <coughs> I'm not a fan of fencing off our European cloud. In fact, I'm quite opposed to that and I've said that in the past. So we would need to change the language on that. And I want to make that very clear to the, an external audience that's watching as well as to my two colleagues. And I want to say that now uh, before Mrs. Ludford leaves. So if you would allow me to do that, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Moraes. And now the next, uh, uh, Mrs. Gomez, please. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I'd like as well to thank uh, Claude Moraes for the very intense and uh, high quality report that he presented to us as a result of all the auditions we have conducted and all the contacts we have made. It's really uh, an excellent basis of work um, and more than that and uh, as a, a co-rapporteur on AFET's uh, opinion I'm very grateful as well for the way we have indeed cooperated as Mr. Salafranc and, and Claude Moraes himself have uh, highlighted. Um, I think indeed this is about um, shared values, shared values among EU members, shared values with the US. And, and I think this is even more important for people who, like myself, come from former totalitarian states. I lived, I lived 21 years under dictatorship. So it's really, um, it's really not just about the rule of the law, the respect for the privacy of the citizens. It's also about the effectiveness in fighting terrorism. And that, I firmly believe, cannot be achieved if we resort to the same methodology of terrorists, undemocratic and unlawful methodology. That simply is not an effective way to fight terrorism, is to actually reinforcing the hands of terrorists, is be becoming ourselves terrorists, terrorists. So I think indeed that the role of Edward Snowden uh, should be highlighted because he, his disclosure has been very important, not just to give the, in the information about the way the privacy of citizens in the EU, but in the US, all over the world, is massively being violated, as well as how that is being perverted for uh, Orwellian and not so Orwellian purposes, namely in terms of espionage, political, economical, and so on. And even more important, the way he has shown that indeed tools that are designed to fight terrorism are not effective. Because if the mass surveillance system that NSA has implemented with the pretext of fighting terrorism has indeed been putting a lot of efforts and resources in uh, uh, massive surveillance of citizens from all over the world and has allowed, it, for instance, two Chechen guys who blew up the, the Boston Marathon, on, which, on whom there was clear, direct intelligence that was neglected. It actually shows how there is an efficiency in the fight against terrorism. So I think, uh, indeed, this is an element that should also be here in, reflected, and it is in many ways. 
I believe that, uh, as it has been said, we have strong data protection in the EU, but we do not implement it. We have a real problem of enforcement, as Sophie and Velton said. And that we cannot blame the US, we have to blame our own agencies and our own institutions who do not perform their role of oversight, political, judicial, whatever, when there is the opportunity. And uh, we have seen the case of Belga.com that points out, of course, it might be ultimately as well a, a, a US responsibility, but this is a, a European member responsibility. And of course, in the case of Belga.com, it was obviously directed not just at, you know, uh, uh, irrelevant European parliamentary members, but there are guys like Mr. Barroso, Mr. Barnier, uh, Mrs. Reving, who do important job that is probably uh, interested to be spied upon by others. So, I mean, I note, for instance, that now in the U.S. there is a debate uh, whether the NSA is not denying they, had, they have been spying Congress members. And I remember when we were in the U.S., I was going around asking what more when they were telling us that they were terrified with what was still to come from Edward Snowden. said, what else? Worse can come out. Because at that point we already knew about the spying on Merkel. Only spying on Obama himself. And interestingly, nobody denied that. Nobody said, oh, no. So I think we, we are here talking about the essence of the rule of the law and of our democratic uh, states. Finally, I would just like to say that I share what others' concerns about the phrase on Article 59 on TTIP. I think we can formulate uh, the, the, the sentence better because actually what I want, it's about building trust as others have said, but the most essential thing is indeed, in my opinion, is to have the US act in a way to help us build that trust. And the most essential thing, in my opinion, is what concerns the umbrella agreement, the framework agreement, because how can we have a minimum trust if we don't have the basic right to redress um, judicial and administrative to uh, EU citizens in the US. Uh, and finally, I will only stress, indeed, the question of oversight responsibilities is crucial, and it's not just the job for national parliaments and national authorities. If they don't do their job, I think we could and we should point at a reversal of the subsidiarity uh, uh, principle. If they don't do their job, as obviously many of them don't do, it is the case in my country, Portugal, then it should be this parliament who should indeed make sure that the laws and the procedures, are in, even in member states, ought to be reviewed. Thank you, Mrs. Gomez. Mrs. Imenez Bessario. Muchísimas gracias, señor President. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Let me first of all congratulate Claude Murray, the rapporteur, with whom I was able to work in Washington when we went there. I think we were able to note there that this is a subject that worries not just European public opinion, but also greatly concerns American public opinion. And that's always a good thing. Usually they're not that interested in our subjects, but this time they are. I was able to explain there all the things that concern us here as citizens' representatives. I think our fellow citizens are very worried about privacy, but they're also worried, equally worried, about their own security. So we have to be very careful when we start dealing with anything that has to do with terrorism. It's unacceptable, intolerable to have mass espionage. Uh, intolerable in human rights terms, but we can't have as an immediate consequence of that concern the uh, abolition of anti-terrorist programs. And there's no reason at all why SWIFT should be the um, scapegoat of this deplorable scandal, because I don't think SWIFT is directly related with this massive espionage. And it's known perfectly well and generally that SWIFT has worked quite well so far. In fact, when we went to Washington, Claude Marais will confirm, it was explained to us that uh, SWIFT had been very effective against enormous dangers. 
but unfortunately you can't publicise this kind of thing for obvious reasons. But the hundreds of attempt of uh, terrorist attacks have been put off, have been prevented by uh, by this arrangement. Uh, Mrs. Gomez should think of that. We also need to think of the potential of our agencies, Europol and NSA, and NISA, to continue independently at European level uh, while cooperating in a balanced way with the United States. The important thing is the message that we're sending citizens from this Parliament, and in that I agree with Mrs. Entfeld. We are the only ones who are moving, and that's very important. We have to give a message of responsibility, and I don't think it would be responsible to suspend SWIFT, as the only people who would like that would be the people who finance terrorism, in other words, the terrorists themselves. So in general, I support this text, but with some reservations that I've explained. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Angel. Mulțumesc, doamnă președinte. În primul rând, aș dori și eu să-l felicit pe Claude pentru raportul. Thank you very much, madam. I'd like, first of all, to congratulate our colleague Claude Morris for his report and for the cooperation that he's shown and his capacity for work, which struck me. I fully agree with all the recommendations contained here. But I think that when it is approved, obviously, with necessary amendments, then the European Parliament will have to mobilise in such a way as to impose this democratic accountability that will be necessary in order in the future to prevent mass surveillance. That will be the right balance between the fight against terrorism and the kind of abuse that we've seen up until now. Now let me quickly tell you a story. This is something that happened in Romania, in my country, a few days ago. The personal account of the, of the Romanian intelligence service uh, was parroted, was broken into, which shows that uh, a secret service perhaps needs to be setting up more protect better protection systems rather than looking only at surveillance systems. Uh, please try to be very brief if it's possible. Okay, Kinga, I will, I will be brief. I'll be re really brief. How brief do you want me to be? Very, very brief. Um, I, to be honest, uh, I think uh, what I said at the beginning of the session was that there is a high level of expertise amongst members and those members who are not specialists in data protection as I was, and I have an expertise in many areas of justice and home affairs in my background, but not in data protection. And again, that was it's reflected here too, where we have members who are experts in privacy matters and data protection matters, but also we have members here who are experts in other fields, and you can see that in the contribution. So I won't attempt to answer questions with their permission, where there were self-standing uh, comments. Um, but I'll very briefly just pick up on really points where, for example, colleagues have asked me to, to answer on the record really quickly um, their questions. I mean, very quickly, um, both Theresa and uh, Mr. Perker, um, so that I'm not accused of not answering these key questions, uh, raised the issue of um, intelligence gathering and also the issue of SWIFT. I want to very openly say that um, there will be elements of the report, of course. This is a draft report, and we have now had a legacy of intense um, activity on issues um, like SWIFT, on Safe Harbour and so on. We've had many resolutions, commission statements and so on, where we have had some political differences between our groups. And, of course, this will be reflected in the report also. Um, but I want colleagues to understand that I, I understand the nuances and differences very much. Um, this doesn't mean that I don't understand the worth of SWIFT intrinsically as, a, as an operation. We, of course, negotiated that, that agreement. I was there at the time. Um, what we have to do in the report is look at the allegations themselves. 
Um, but of course, within our <coughs> political groups, we may have differences on what ends up being in the report, and this is why we have this amendment period. So I do want to acknowledge that there will be some of those differences. What I hope will happen, and now I refer to the foreign affairs paragraphs too, where um, Mr. Salafranca mentioned there may be some amendments to, and Mrs. Gomez, I think, um, referred to that too in our shadow meetings, is that where there may be amendments, uh, I hope that it will not, in the end, change the emphasis of the report, which will be um, what, I, what was the thrust coming from the shadows, who, I, I know it's commonplace, and I promise I'm not going to take up much time, to thank the shadows, but here, the shadows um, created this report because they produce working documents. This is the methodology we pursued. And what I'm hoping is that if you look at this report, um, and here I want to also put on record my thanks to the entire Secretariat who put so much work <coughs> in, is that they have produced, um, if you look at pages uh, 30, um, I think it's 32 and 33, um, a European Digital Habeas Corpus, something really special, which is a is a in answer to Mrs. Ernst. Is Cornelia still here? She's still here. No. Okay, people are starting to go, so I really will speed up. She talked about what happens to this report. You know, is it just going to be thrown away, kind of thing? Um, there is a, a blow by blow <coughs> timetable picking up on when the recommendations can happen and how this report will, 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 will be taken forward. And I know time is short, so I just want to make this point. What, what is happening in this report and how, how the questions have developed are in relation to two types of issues um, that we've looked at in this. And because I'm not an expert on data protection, as some of my colleagues are, I've noticed two things. One area where we have EU competence, clear competence, and some areas where we have real moral or political <coughs> responsibility. So in oversight, where there is national responsibility, we have real moral and political responsibility because we are from those member states. And maybe our citizens are saying, what, what are we doing on this? What's our involvement? But we have EU competence in some of the negotiated areas, so safe harbour, SWIFT and so on, TTIP and so on. And what I've noticed is that we are expected to then react to all of these things. And what I think is good about this report, where the work has gone in, is in looking at this European Digital Habeas Corpus, a way of saying to the next mandate, to the Commission, uh, but also to um, the Member States, no, we won't ignore oversight <coughs> with the Member States. We will convene a conference to look at the oversight mechanisms of Member States. We won't abdicate that responsibility. We won't pretend it's our competence, but we will address it. We will have a timetable for it. And then when it comes to those hard areas where we have clear competence, safe harbour, swift, even where there are differences of opinion, we will enter that territory and we will make a clear recommendation. And then, of course, in the amendment stage, we may have political differences. So I hope this report will, will understand that we are a serious parliament. And i just end on this. I read this week um, in The Economist, the Lexington column, column of The Economist, which is the one written by the Washington correspondent. He, he mentioned that the European parliament, was, European parliament was good at indignation which I thought was really interesting. He admitted that the European Parliament uh, was dealing seriously with this issue, but then he said, we're always good at indignation. Well, I really believe, and I echo what Mrs. Interfelt said at the beginning, that I feel very proud that there are members in this Parliament, some of whom went to Washington, those who have gone through all of these very difficult, more than 15 hearings, and then those shadows who contributed to this report. I've never seen such a process where the Secretariat was so heavily involved as well, um, where we have made, tried to make out of a very difficult, nebulous process um, and try to then make it into a serious, um, detailed process at the end. And I think, I think this report does reflect that. So I'm very happy that we've tried to do that at the end and not just have indignation, but something serious in terms of recommendations with a timetable. So I hope members will see that when they start to amend the report and that we do support it eventually in February in committee and in March. And I look forward to seeing the amendments and I look forward to that cooperative period in the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much. And thank you, Kinga, for your cooperation. Thank you, Claude.
Now, uh, I have to announce the deadline for tabling amendments is the 22nd of January, 6 o'clock in the afternoon. And thank you all, colleagues, for your cooperation and involvement. And now I go to the last point on our agenda for this afternoon. And, uh,